President Ciceron, colleagues and friends, it is with profound thanks and great humility that I stand before you today to accept this enormous honor you bestow upon me. I accept it as an invitation to redouble my efforts and to mobilize even more of my colleagues and compatriots in the cause of science. In that latter sense, it is a timely award indeed. As you all know, this has been the Arab Spring. Ordinary citizens have toppled autocrats and still battled dictators armed with little more than their convictions. Ultimately, they cannot be denied. For as Victor Hugo has said, no army can defeat an idea whose time has come. And freedom, human rights, and democracy are ideas whose time has come for even the most remote corners of the globe. Sparked by the successes of Tunisia and Egypt, the people speak. From the Syrian demonstrators of Damascus and Dara to the embattled Libyan defenders of the encircled city of Mistrata, to the chanting Yemeni crowds in Sana'a, they are the embodiment of the unconquerable spirit described by Henley's Invictus. It matters not how straight the gate, how charged with punishment the scroll. I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul. This surge for freedom reminiscent of the best in American history, from the Founding Fathers to Lincoln to Martin Luther King, that surge will face setbacks to be sure, but ultimately it must triumph. Today, there are those who fear that the Arab Spring will give way to the Islamist winter, that the idealism of the revolutionary Democrats will only pave the way for theological autocrats. And yes, Islamist sentiment is rising and zealotry is expanding in parts of the public realm. But the defense against extremism is not by censorship or autocracy. It is by embracing pluralism and defeating ideas with ideas. And here, science has much to say. Science has much to say to the Islamist zealots who preach an intolerant doctrine. It has much to say to young Democrats enamored of the new technologies. It has much to say to those who yearn for a better economic future. And more importantly, it has much to say about the kind of values that we must adopt if our societies are to be truly open and democratic, for these are the values of science. To the Islamists who yearn to return to their particular vision of the Muslim past, we say, there is a great Arab and Muslim tradition of science and tolerance that you must be aware of. Indeed, throughout the Dark Ages, it was the Muslims who held up the torch of rationality and reason while Europe was in the grip of bigotry and intolerance. Centuries before Bacon, Descartes, and Galileo, Ibn al-Haytham in the 10th century laid down the rules of the empirical approach, describing how the scientific method should operate through observation, measurement, experiment, and conclusion. He said, we start by observing reality. We then proceed by increasing our research and measurement, subjecting premises to criticism, and being cautious in drawing conclusions. In all we do, our purpose should be the search for truth, not support of opinion. Likewise, listen to the voice of Ibn Nafis, coming from the 13th century, on accepting the contrarian view, 
subject only to the test of evidence and rational analysis. He says, when hearing something unusual, do not preemptively reject it, for that would be folly. Indeed, horrible things may be true, and familiar and praised things may prove to be lies. Truth is truth unto itself, not because many people say it is. Now, this is the Muslim tradition that must be revived if the Arab world, Muslim and non-Muslim alike, will indeed join the ranks of the advanced societies of our time. Rejecting politicized religiosity and reviving these traditions would promote the values of science in our societies. To the youth, enamored with new technologies or simply seeking a better economic future. We say, remember science and the scientific method for it is scientific insight and knowledge that gives birth to technology. We must be the producers of knowledge, not just the consumers of technology. And that will not happen unless we open our minds to science and the scientific approach and open our hearts to the values of science. So what are these values of science that I keep returning to as the basis for enhancing human capabilities and ensuring the public welfare. As Bronowski observed more than half a century ago, the enterprise of science requires the adoption of certain values. Truth, honor, teamwork, a constructive subversiveness, engagement with the other, freedom, imagination, and the method for the arbitration of disputes. The values of science are adhered to by its practitioners with a rigor that shames all other professions. Truth. Any scientist who manufactures his data is ostracized forever from the scientific community. She or he may err in interpreting the data, but no one can accept fabrication of data. In no other field of human activity is this commitment to truth so absolute? Honor. Scientists reject plagiarism. To give each his or her due is essential, a sentiment well captured in Newton's famous statement that if I have seen farther than most, it is because I have stood on the shoulders of giants. Teamwork has become essential in most fields of science. And the essence of teamwork is to ensure that all members of the team receive the recognition that they deserve. But more importantly, science advances by overthrowing the existing paradigm, or at least significantly expanding or modifying it. Thus, there is a certain constructive subversiveness built into the scientific enterprise, as a new generation of scientists makes its own contribution. And so it must be. Without that, there would be no scientific advancement. But our respect and admiration for Newton is not diminished by the contributions of Einstein. We can and do admire both. And this constant renewal and advancement of our scientific understanding is a feature of the scientific enterprise. And it requires a tolerant engagement with the contrarian view, accepting to arbitrate disputes by the rules of evidence and rationality. Science requires freedom. Freedom to inquire, to challenge, to think, to imagine the unimagined. It cannot function within the arbitrary limits of convention, nor can it flourish if it is forced to shy away from challenging the accepted. Finally, it is the content of the scientific work that is discussed, not the person who produced it. Regardless of their nationality, or the color of their skin, or the god they choose to worship, or the ethnic group they were born into, or their gender. These, I say, are societal values worth defending, not just to promote the pursuit of science, but to have a better 
and more humane society. These are the central core of universal values that any truly modern society must possess. President Cicerone, colleagues and friends, this medal is not just a great honor. It is an inspiration for me and for others to redouble our efforts to spread these humane values of science that I insist on calling the values of science, especially for our youth who sparked our revolution, just as other young people transformed societies, reinvented business enterprise, and redefined our scientific understanding of the world we live in. And so, to our youth I say, you have been called the children of the internet or the Facebook generation, but you are more. You are the vanguard of the great global revolution of the 21st century. So embrace the values of science and go forth into the journey of your lives to create a better world for yourselves and for others. Think of the unborn, remember the forgotten, give hope to the forlorn, include the excluded, reach out to the unreached, and by your actions from this day onwards, lay the foundations for better tomorrows. The members of the Academy, I say, thank you. Thank you from the bottom of my heart.